back, everyone, to Live with Haruhi Jones. Yay! Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I just want to say how good it is to be back in the studio after COVID-19. I mean, I think that it's really all over now and we can all go back to our normal lives. You may have seen a clip of our next guest. Now, before he comes out, I just want to say that we're all heartbroken about what's going on in the city tonight. But this is how I want to come out, and honestly, I think we can all use a good laugh. So please welcome Doctus! <laughs> Let me tell you, Haruhi, the events of Joker seem a lot more believable now than they did eight months ago. Black lives matter, all cops are bastards. However, despite the relevancy to current times, I will not be talking about social upheaval and the potential for positive change in this video. Despite being made well before our current crisis began, there have already been many, many video essays made on that subject. And as such, I link to some of my favorites in the info bar above me. No, instead, I'll be talking about the part of Joker that I believe has not gotten enough coverage. When I heard the following two lines in the movie, I found them to be much more than catchy one-liners or crazy ramblings of a madman, but I think that that is what people have generally taken them as. And instead, I think that they are the movie's main reason for existing. Roll the clips. I used to think that my life was a tragedy, but now I realize it's a fucking comedy. Nothing can hurt me anymore. <laughs> My life is nothing but a comedy. These lines are not just innocuous, jokery things. What does Arthur mean by them? Is he just saying that he finds some things funny that other people don't? That might be the simplest explanation, especially given the way the comedy is defined in this movie, but I don't think it's the correct one. I think this is actually Arthur making a meta commentary on the movie Joker as a whole. It just happens to also be commentary that works diegetically or that is within the context of the scene. I believe that in these lines, director Todd Phillips explicitly states what he was trying to do with Joker, and he just uses a bit of a double meaning to get the message across. I think that in Joker, Todd Phillips tried to defy traditional notions of comedy and tragedy in a way that makes it so you can't even call Joker a tragic comedy. Joker dances with the traditional dichotomy of a sad story versus a happy story in an extremely unique and compelling way. But I think I should outline what exactly I mean by tragedy and comedy first. Also, I'm assuming you've seen Joker, because if you haven't, this essay won't make sense to you. Ah! Part 1. Defining Tragedy and Comedy. It's important to make the distinction between the more popular definitions of tragedy and comedy that you would find in everyday life, and the ones that you would use to define works of fiction, such as Joker and every other play, movie, or book that you would come across. To begin with, in everyday life, a tragedy is just some sort of extremely awful event where just calling it bad wouldn't suffice. 9-11 was a tragedy. The Great Chinese Famine was a tragedy. No, instead, when I refer to tragedy, I am instead talking about the genre of drama that involves the downfall of the main character, usually to condemn some sort of wicked actions that they perform. Examples of famous tragedies include Macbeth, Oedipus Rex, and Citizen Kane. Likewise, for comedy, I'm not referring simply to funny things. Instead, I'm talking about the genre of drama that is the opposite of tragedy, the one where the character faces some sort of hardship and then emerges stronger from it at the end. This is a very broad definition, of course, and because of that, basically every movie that is released today falls under it. Just to give you some examples, I think that Disney's Aladdin, Steven Spielberg's Jurassic Park, and George Lucas's Star Wars all fall under this broad definition. Humor doesn't have to be a central component of comedies. For these definitions, I am citing old man Aristotle himself and his classic treatise on drama, Poetics. This is the famous work by the Athenian polymath that lays out what he thinks makes for a good tragedy and good comedy, though most of the passages about comedy have sadly been lost to history. It is perhaps most famous for this quote, Poetry is a more philosophical and a higher thing than history, for poetry tends to express the universal history the particular. For Aristotle, poetry refers not only to poems, but to music, and to plays as well. It is important to remember that there weren't any novels in Aristotle's time, the closest thing being the Homeric works of the Iliad and the Odyssey. As such, 
It is much of a stretch to think that Aristotle's poetics sought to comment on all works of fiction that he believed existed. And, to the best of our knowledge, those were the only forms of fiction that existed. The plays that existed at this time, for instance, were just those of ancient Greek theater, and the plays of ancient Greek theater fell into three categories, comedy, tragedy, and a satyr play, which Aristotle doesn't really talk about much and which we'll get to later. Anyhow, Aristotle defines tragedy as an imitation of an action that is serious, complete, and of a certain magnitude, which through pity and fear affects the proper propagation of these emotions. That is, tragedy has the goal of giving a feeling of catharsis to the audience. Aristotle further says that in the perfect tragedy, the change of fortune presented must be on that of a man who is not eminently good and just, yet whose misfortune is brought about not by vice or depravity, but by some error or frailty. He must be one who is highly renowned and prosperous, a personage like Oedipus. In contrast, Aristotle says, Comedy is an imitation of characters of a lower type, not, however, in the full sense of the word bad, the ludicrous being merely a subdivision of the ugly. It consists in some defect or ugliness which is not painful or destructive. To take an obvious example, the comic mask is ugly and distorted, but does not imply pain. In other words, in comedy, the characters shouldn't be pristine, but they shouldn't suffer a fate that results in prolonged injury or death. Thus, tragedy and comedy are two sides of the same coin. In both of them, the main character faces hardship, but in tragedy, they perish, and in comedy, they emerge stronger. Which one the audience feels should happen depends on the morality of the character. If they are immoral, the audience feels they should be punished, whereas if they are moral, the audience feels they should be rewarded. If these simple rules are followed, and everything else is generally done well in the drama, then the audience should leave with a sense of satisfaction, as if everything else is right with the world. In contrast, if everything else is done well, but these simple rules are broken for no particularly good reason, then the audience will leave feeling unsure about how they are supposed to feel. For example, if, at the end of Jurassic Park, the heroes were all eaten by the T-Rex, the audience will not feel like that was a satisfactory ending. On the other hand, if Dr. Alan Grant espoused racist philosophy as he saved the other main characters, the audience would, hopefully, feel very conflicted over whether he should get a happy ending. Now these are rules that pretty much everybody knows just by intuition, because they are the same rules that we want our societies to be built on. We want a good man to get good things, and we want a bad man to receive bad things. But, as we also all know, that is rarely how society actually works. It is quite uncommon for somebody to lose or gain social standing or wealth purely based on character. Instead, it is usually due to some combination of upbringing and luck. And because of the complex world that we live in, a third genre of play emerged, the tragicomedy, or in Aristotle's time, the satyr play. Now, Aristotle didn't really have much to say about the satyr play, and only one complete satyr play has survived to the present day. But in general, it seems that satyr plays took events that happened in tragedies or epics and commented on them and made them more comedic. In effect, they satirized them. The modern tragicomedy is much different, and much harder to pin down. One of the most famous tragicomedy plays is Waiting for Godot, which is famously described by Irish critic Vivian Mercer as a play where nothing happens twice because there are two acts. Fully uninitiated, the play is about two men, Vladimir and Estragon, who twice wait all day for a character named Godot who never appears. It is famous for having many, many interpretations, including it being a statement on the futility of existence in modern times, a portrayal of the modern Christian waiting for the rapture, or a satire of how small states can do nothing but wait for big states to boss them around. If the play is thought about hard, it is difficult to try to explain every little facet of it, but if it is instead just taken as a feeling, it becomes somewhat easy to get at least a surface understanding of it. Many, many people can relate to an experience of just waiting for whatever they are hoping for to come along and set their life in motion. The famous description of nothing happening in Waiting for Godot is actually quite after tragic comedy as a whole. The traditional story of triumph in comedy, or downfall in tragedy, is abandoned in this hybrid form, and often, characters end up right back where they started without having learned anything. 
The film Modern Times, which is shown in Joker, is actually a tragic comedy as well, for Charlie Chaplin's character of the Tramp isn't generable, a likable character who the audience is supposed to relate with, and who comedic situations happen to. And yet, by the end, the character is homeless and jobless. Unlike Waiting for Godot, Modern Times is quite easy to understand. The poor, modern laborer is becoming increasingly dehumanized and irrelevant. It's a movie that makes the audience feel correct when they believe the world is unjust, compared to the classic view of a comedy or tragedy making the audience feel correct when they believe that the world is just. It's fairly ironic in Joker that Modern Times is being watched by the richest of the rich in Gotham, who wouldn't really be able to connect with the film's message. So now we've established what tragedy, comedy, and tragic comedy are, which one of those three is Joker? Well, it contains both tragic and comedic elements, and thus, it's a tragic comedy. But really, I think that just leaving it at that is doing a disservice to the movie that Todd Phillips crafted. The director of Joker repeatedly misleads the audience, and in doing so, he makes it so that the audience intentionally does not know what they're supposed to feel by the end of the movie. If I was introduced to just two options, tragedy or comedy, as to what to describe Joker with, I don't think I'd be able to give an entirely truthful answer. This is still similar to most of their tragic comedies, but the difference is that in Joker, we aren't even sure whether a single scene is supposed to be tragic or comic. We only know that that scene has an extremely powerful event in it. Why did Todd Phillips decide to craft the movie this way, and what is he saying by doing so? To answer that question, we'll move to the next section. Part 2. Scenes from Joker Before we get into the movie itself, we need to look at why Todd Phillips might have chosen to make a tragic comedy in the first place. As already established, most movies that come out these days are comedies. This goes double for superhero films, as these big budget action flicks contain some of the most traditional comedy stories possible. A person with good morals faces hardship, but overcomes it and ends the movie happier and or stronger. Superheroes are often seen as goodness given form, Superman being the most obvious example. When Man of Steel came out, it had understandably received criticism because its tone was oddly dark. Superheroes are meant to be idealized versions of regular people, so if they act bad, it feels wrong. Skewing heavily towards traditional comedy thus makes total sense. Taking both the 9 DCEU films and the 23 MCU films together, only Captain America Civil War and Avengers Infinity War can really be called tragedies. A case can be made for Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, but while Superman does die in that movie, Lex Luthor is ultimately defeated. Even in the Marvel tragedies, the events of both are largely negated by the end of Avengers Endgame. So, therefore, when making a superhero movie, you need to make it a comedy, right? So, Joker has to be a comedy then. Well, on the flip side, no, that would make no sense, because that the character of Joker is a villain and not a hero, and portraying him simply as a hero wouldn't really be doing his character justice. Another problem is that the most famous origin story of the Joker, portrayed in Batman the Killing Joke, is an extremely classic tragedy, with a man who is ruined by his own hubris. Since Joker is also an origin story, it wouldn't really make sense to have one story's tone completely contradict the other. So, what did Todd Phillips do? Well, he decided to make both. At the same time. An hour comedy was off limits, but an hour tragedy was also probably wrong for a character that also has literal white skin and green hair and gets off on a good joke. So let's now begin to look at everything scene by scene and determine whether we're looking at a comic moment, a tragic moment, a tragic comic moment, or one that we can't really tell which one it is. I will also be commenting on what I feel the audience is supposed to be thinking in these scenes, and how the movie later subverts those expectations. So beginning with the first scene of the film, you can already see that playing with comedy and tragedy will be one of the core themes of the movie. In this famous shot, Arthur is manly contorting his face into a grin while a tear slides down his cheek. While Aristotle said the comic mask is ugly and distorted, but does not imply pain, this shot instead obviously implies some sort of it. Putting such a shot as one of the first things the audience sees guarantees its importance in the film, and Arthur's uncontrollable laughter in the rest of the movie reminds the audience of this theme throughout. This blurring of comedy and tragedy furthermore tells the audience that any form of happiness that is to be found in this movie will probably be twisted, forced, or at least uncomfortable in some way, just like Arthur's distressing fits. In the next sequence, Arthur gets mugged and beaten up by a gang of kids. It's a scene that doesn't really have any levity or nuance. It is just a tragic and unjust moment, one that makes the audience immediately start looking out for moments of catharsis later on, 
as this one scene already creates so much tension. This in itself also makes the audience assume that the film will be a tragedy, as the need for catharsis is indicative of that genre. We want things to get better for Arthur. On the other hand, the audience already knows he will become the Joker, which must mean things will get worse again in the end. So, one naturally assumes that we will see Arthur begin an unsteady ascent to power very soon, or at least sometime in the next few scenes, so that he has somewhere to fall from later. Instead, Phillips entirely subverts these expectations. Things only get worse for Arthur in the following scenes. His counselor doesn't listen to him, he has an incredibly uncomfortable moment with the parent on the bus, and his boss rates him for getting mugged instead of offering a helping hand. The happiest one for Arthur in these early scenes is actually a fantasy sequence that the audience should perceive as tragic, the one where he is praised by Zaldo Murray Franklin. Other highlights in these early scenes include Arthur not knowing when to laugh at jokes, stalking women he met on an elevator, and being told point blank by his own mother that he is not funny. A small moment of happiness comes up when the elevator woman tells Arthur she would love to see him at a comedy club soon, but this little bit of levity should feel quite odd to the audience, as it was earned by Arthur stalking her. The final straw in this whole terrible heap of tragedy is Arthur getting fired from his job through a set of circumstances the audience feels he had no way of avoiding, and then beginning to go home in the subway as a broken, dejected person. It is here in this scene that we finally get the feeling of catharsis that we've been craving for the last 30 or 40 minutes. Here, Arthur is berated by three businessmen. The men begin attacking him and beating him up, in much the same way the kids did at the beginning of the movie. Now, however, something has changed. Arthur has a gun. Arthur shoots and kills two of the men in self-defense before pursuing and gunning down the third in cold blood. For the first time in the movie, Arthur comes out victorious. But of course, there is a problem with this victory. He has just killed three men. The audience is forced into feeling a sense of relief, and maybe even happiness from this scene. But thinking of it from a truly rational standpoint, killing other people is not something to be celebrated. This means the audience is left confused and conflicted about their own feelings, but also about where the movie will go from here. Is this another tragedy in a seemingly endless string of them Arthur will be a part of, or is it the first step in his rise to betterment? Either answer is problematic in some way, the first because of feeling, and the second because of ration. Neither one can be entirely correct. Regardless, that question will be on the audience's mind as we move into the next stage of the film. However, something that is quite clear is how Arthur himself feels about the crimes he has just committed. He dances in the bathroom directly afterwards, and then barges into the elevator woman's apartment and kisses her. The next day, he walks out of his job, but not before sowing doubt amongst his co-workers and destroying or vandalizing property. In the second and final visit he has with his counselor, he tells her he's finally beginning to feel like he actually exists, and he stands up to her when she continues to ignore him. Finally, he performs at Pogo's Comedy Club for the first time, and then goes on a date with his new girlfriend. For Arthur, this is definitely a new stage, one that might lead to him actually feeling good for the first time in his life. But for the audience, the events we see are much less clear-cut. For starters, even before a twist over his girlfriend is revealed, all the scenes with her feel somewhat off, starting and ending at odd times, and her having somewhat unbelievable reactions to things. Then, in regards to him walking out of his job, he was already fired before it, so any sense of victory isn't really warranted. He also doesn't succeed in turning anybody against Randall, and his attempt at jokes lead to awkward silence for everybody other than him. This awkward silence continues in a comedy routine, but he does, as he is so nervous at first that he can't do anything but laugh. He does appear to turn his comedy routine around, but the canned laugh track after the audio fades is not very convincing proof. Finally, in regards to his counselor, even though he is able to stand up to her, she still doesn't listen to him, instead of completely ignoring what he's just said and giving him the bad news that he won't be able to see her anymore, and he won't be able to get access to any of the drugs he needs either. So these events too, the audience cannot be sure as to whether they are happy or whether they are sad. The walking out of his job scene, as well as the scene with the counselor, might cause further feelings of catharsis, but rationally, they are far from relieving. In the next few scenes, our perception of them as tragic once again lines up with Arthur's view of them, and as such, I won't really be commenting much on them. Arthur finds out Thomas Wayne might be his father, and he tries to meet him, but he is stopped at the gates of his mansion. There, he meets a young Bruce, dressed in basically the same outfit as he is. It makes sense as to why Phyllis would cease the disconnect between Arthur's feelings and the audience's at this point, as this scene is supposed to instead show how wealth and privilege left the two very different lives for the two characters which, as a Joker says in The Killing Joke, aren't really so different from each other. The similar clothing reinforces the point. In the next scene, Arthur's mom is rushed to the hospital after running with the detectives who are looking for the subway murderer, the first instance of actual repercussions for Arthur's actions. While she's in the hospital, Arthur achieves what could have been a great personal victory. A clue of him is played on his idol Murray Franklin show. Unfortunately, though, even Arthur receives this moment as tragic, as Murray uses Arthur's clip to belittle him and make fun of his routine. 
Arthur then goes and actually meets Thomas Wayne at the Modern Times screening, where his dad rudely tells him the real truth, leading to Arthur stealing his mother's foul from Arkham State Hospital, notably another crime that feels more like a triumph, and realizing that he is a product of abuse and his mother was much more neglectful than he ever thought. This unraveling leads to another, as the truth about his apparent girlfriend comes out soon after, Arthur realizes their time together was nothing more than a figment of his imagination. With this, Arthur is forced to recontextualize much of the triumph he believed he had felt earlier in the movie. This leads us to the scene where one of the lines at the beginning of the video comes from. I used to think that my life was a tragedy, but now I realize it's a fucking comedy. This is what Arthur says right before he kills his mom, which, depending on how you look at it, is either a triumphant defeat of someone who wronged him earlier in his life and is kept in shackled down for the rest of it, or just another senseless murder done by a broken man. I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. What I think is most important about this scene is, of course, that line. Well, this can just be taken as Arthur going completely crazy and not knowing anymore what's funny and what isn't. As I said earlier, this can also be read as a direct meta-commentary on the events of the movie up until now. The movie has misled us many times and gone down pathways tragedy would never go on. But what if we start thinking that Joker is a comedy instead? Not in the funny haha -ha sense, of course, but instead in the way that it follows the traditional pathway of a comedy. In a comedy, things generally have to get worse for the protagonist before they get better. But things getting worse might be portrayed in a comedic manner, but for the protagonist, they're usually anything but funny. Just think of Todd Phillips' previous Hangover trilogy, where the ragtag friends have to contend with gunfights, tigers, injury, drugs, gangs, and much, much more. As has been proven many times, tragedy and comedy are two sides of the same coin. Or, as Mel Brooks famously put it, tragedy is when I cut my finger. Comedy is when you fall into an open sewer and die. So even though we don't perceive the events of Joker to be funny, it doesn't mean that it cannot follow the traditional pathway of a comedy. If we remove the drapery of catharsis that Todd Phillips put over it, and then we also get rid of the delusions that Arthur himself had, then we are left with a story where the character started off low and only went lower afterwards. So, as such, because we now know that a comedy can start with tragedy, then we can start to feel that when Joker kills his mother, it is the beginning of a final rapid ascent that is indicative of a comedy. Arthur's gotten called in to reprise his comedy act on Live with Murray Franklin, and he means to put on a great show. He first intends to commit suicide live on air as a way to escape his awful life. As he's practicing his routine, we seem genuinely smile without any delusion from one of the first times in the movie. The life that's caused him so much pain will all be over soon. For his final farewell to the world, he decides to go all out, abandon the depressing legacy of his past persona carnival, and formally embrace a new identity as Joker. While he's applying makeup for what he believes will be his final clown costume, he gets a knock on the door. It's Gary and Randall from work, and Randall's looking for answers from Joker, as the cops are now beginning to breathe down his neck. Instead of fanning niceties for any longer, however, Joker kills Randall with a pair of scissors while Gary watches in horror in the corner. We see here how Joker has gotten more and more comfortable with murder. He has progressed from only killing when provoked, to suffocating his mother and feeling ambivalent, to killing his worst enemy in a gruesome and prolonged manner, and then laughing about it. Fittingly, this scene is depicted in a way that is anything but dark, despite its subject matter being more reminiscent of some twisted black comedy or tragic comedy as Arthur makes cheap jokes at Gary's expense, culminating in the classic joke of Gary being too short to reach a door's lock and needing the murderous madman to do it for him. The fact that Phyllis forces us to see the comedic side of this murder, and in the same perspective that Joker sees it from, once again reinforces the idea of the movie being a comedy instead of a tragedy. Joker then reapplies his blood-soaked makeup, and then dons the rest of his costume. Power tripping, he dances on the now-famous Joker stairs before leading the detectives on a chase through New York's subway system. When two of them are beaten up by a crowd that they incite, I think Todd Phillips intended the audience to feel a little uneasy at the whole prospect of cops getting beaten up, but uh, yeah, that isn't really the case anymore. But uh, regardless, the scene still works as Joker's meant to be happy and triumphant here. Soon we're at the climax of the movie. Joker on stage at Live with Murray Franklin and the infamous acts that erupt from it. 
It is here that we get the second of the two lines I mentioned at the beginning. Nothing can hurt me anymore. <laughs> My life is nothing but a comedy. Apart from what Joker overtly says in this scene, that society is keeping little guys like him down while propping up big guys like Franklin who don't need it anymore, it is also saying something about the traditional plot structure of a comedy. And that is that because Joker is currently on the final ascent that is indicative of a comedy, nothing can hurt him anymore. Nothing can bring him down again. If it did, it would defy the basic plot structure of a comedy. If Joker right now was tackled by security before he could shoot Murray Franklin, it would only convey the message of bad people go to prison. And Todd Phillips clearly wants to say something more than that. And because of that, until Joker is able to achieve that final triumph, nothing can hurt him anymore. Because if it did, the movie would be ruined. So what he is saying is actually completely true. And in the end, that final triumph does come to pass. With the iconic you get what you fucking deserve line, Joker changes his mind about suicide and instead murders his former hero Murray Franklin on live TV. He sits for a second before laughing to himself, relieved and incredulous at what he has just done. He's only then whisked away by the cops and genuinely grins as he watches the riots go by him as he is driven through the city. This is pure comedy for Joker, a true comeuppance, yet the media and the world at large will no doubt portray the events of tonight as a tragedy forever. Which one that it is for the audience depends on how much they bought what Joker said on the show and how much they empathize with what he's experienced in the movie. To complicate things even further, another apparent tragedy occurs in an insert. Bruce Wayne's parents, including the fascist Thomas Wayne, are murdered in front of the young Bruce amidst all the chaos. While Joker himself doesn't directly cause or even witness this event, by inserting one of the most famous comic book tragedies into a scene of triumph for Joker, it forces us to recontextualize it and perhaps see it from his point of view. It is here, though, that even for a lot of people who would have bought Joker's version of events otherwise, but their resolve falters. How much this movie is seen as a comedy versus a tragedy truly hinges on the beliefs of whoever is watching the movie. Something that is relatively unexplored in a form of media such as cinema where the camera's view cannot literally change between viewings. Even the music shows a confusion between comedy and tragedy, as it abruptly switches back and forth multiple times from Cream's White Room to Hilder Goodnadar's familiar haunting strings. The final part of the climax summarizes the movie's entire message in a simplified manner. Just the movie's first scene, and others laugh throughout, have done so before. After the cop car is rammed and Joker is rescued from the wreckage, he climbs atop the destruction and does a completely unrestrained dance as he bleeds from his nose. The city burns in the background, and as hordes of adoring fans cheer for him. In the last shot before the movie fades to black, he takes the blood that's pooling on his face, a tragedy, and uses it to augment his red lipstick, before smiling naturally, a conversion into comedy. So, to recap, Joker is a unique movie because it plays with a dichotomy of tragedy versus comedy, leading to one thinking more critically about both. The movie begins with a tragic moment that makes the audience look for catharsis, making them feel like the movie is a tragedy, before it abandons any notion of a traditional tragic plot. When catharsis does come, in the scene with the murder of the businessman, it is hard for the audience to reconcile the good and bad feelings the scene elicits with each other. Arthur being an unreliable narrator further leads to the audience not knowing in what way they are supposed to interpret his actions. When Arthur instead tells us he views his life as a comedy, it forces us to recontextualize many of the scenes we have witnessed up until now, and come to the revelation that he is right, and that the movie fits the pathway of a comedy much more than that of a tragedy. This view is finally acknowledged as correct with Arthur's transformation into Joker, his rise to power, his nothing can hurt me anymore line, and his triumphant murder of Murray. Unlike most tragic comedies, Joker ends with the main character happy and fulfilled in every way, even though the audience still questions whether or not the movie truly ended well for him. And with that, we will move on to the final segment of this essay, the part where I get political. Part 3, the part where Doctus gets political. Joker says something more than just that it's a cool movie that plays with people's minds. Joker also comments on social issues and who we view as heroes versus who we view as villains. While these are not the main points of my essay, I feel like I'd be doing them a disservice if I did not mention them in some capacity. To do so, let's go back to the climax where Joker is smiling his bloody smile. If we compare it to the first scene of the movie, where Joker's makeup is painted perfectly, 
yet he has to contort his mouth into a smile while crying a single tear, we can start to see the duality that the movie is presenting, that while something might be good for society, it is not always good for the individual living within it, and also that what we see as a comedy and what we see as a tragedy is an issue that needs more attention than we have given it credit for, because that the stories that we tell in our societies will reflect back on the people who live in those societies. As Arthur himself writes, the worst part about having a mental illness is people expect you to behave as if you don't. Everyone's experiences are different, sometimes in ways we have trouble understanding ourselves. A problem one person feels can be solved easily can feel impossible for another. If Joker is a comedy, and Arthur is the protagonist, then he must be the hero of the story. But for most people, Arthur's actions would make him an anti-hero at best. But why should Arthur, a person who cannot help being so far from most people, constrain himself to act in the way most people, or in other words, society, wants him to? Who are we to say that it's wrong for him to kill his oppressors, to permanently break free of his cage? These are the solutions that worked for Arthur, and society was made better for people like him, either because of or in spite of those solutions that he chose. Why this distinction between hero and anti-hero in media? Both serve the same function as the protagonist of a story. All the distinction does is uphold societal norms that promote underprivileged people remaining oppressed. We can expand this to other movies too. For example, Star Wars Return of the Jedi. Why must Luke restrain himself from being tempted by the dark side and not kill the evil Palpatine himself? Why must he forgive his father? If he couldn't find it in his heart to have mercy on or forgive these men who brought untold destruction to the galaxy, does that now make him an anti-hero, a villain to the people that he knows? Nobody else was there with Luke in the throne room when the unlikely events that led to the, apparent, deaths of Palpatine and Vader took place. Must true heroes only wait for an unlikely chain of events to happen in order to emerge victorious? Must they wait for the oppressors to realize themselves that they are bad? Of course. In my random example of Star Wars, there is some justification beyond it just being not a good thing to kill people. For example, in Star Wars, if Luke kills Palpatine, if he kills Darth Vader, he might succumb to the dark side. But while stories can be simple, the world is complex. And by telling the same story again and again, movie studios are telling us that there is a way that the world should work despite the world never really working like that. Things should be able to be defeated permanently. However, in our world, unlike in movies, killing someone does not usually lead to some world-spanning problem being fixed. Even in Joker, one has to imagine that the killings of Murray Franklin and Thomas Wayne do not lead to meaningful and beneficial societal change. Instead, what heroes must defeat in real life are much larger systems and ideologies, ones that can't be beaten by the removal of one point in a vast array. But if it's wrong for heroes in movies to take the most simplistic approach and purposefully kill the villain who, in their world, is the only reason why the world is wrong, what does that say about how heroes should behave in our world? If it's wrong to be too rude to a single person in stories, does that mean it's wrong to be rude to an entire system in the real world? Why should people in power, the ones who uphold society, be able to say whether it's right or wrong for the people being oppressed by that very same society to fight in the ways that they deem necessary. Do people in the real world have to just blindly hope that the oppressors will one day realize that that is what they are, like Vader does in Return of the Jedi? Or can people take matters into their own hands, like Joker does, and try to make a better world all on their own? The police need to be defunded. Systems that make one person more equal than another need to be struck down. Black lives matter. If it is something that needs to be said over and over, it will be and it can't be decided by society whether it is said too loud or too much. As a bit of a denouement, let us look at the final scene of Joker. Arthur is, at first blush, in Arkham State Hospital for all the crimes he has committed. Maybe he actually is in the asylum, but I doubt it. The walls are clean and white, despite what we saw earlier in the movie, and Joker is able to freely run around without a guard leading him places. No, I actually think this is a complete fantasy of Arthur's, one where he actually holds all the power, the most important facet, undoubtedly, is that the counselor who is talking to him actually listens to him. Arthur gets his wish in this fantasy. He's free to do whatever he wants. When he laughs, he does it because he legitimately thought of a joke in his head. When he speaks, 
people listen. When he runs, he presumably even breaks laws of physics by appearing in the same place he was before. He may have blood on his hands, or his shoes in this case, but there is more than what meets the eye. Joker is not locked up. He is happy and free, just not in the way one might expect. The only question remaining for the viewer is whether this fantasy is in line with reality, or whether it exists in opposition to it. That is, in the viewer's eyes, should Joker be locked up for good and treated as a villain? Or, instead, should we re-examine what caused him to commit his acts of vigilante justice and maybe instead let him be free for the first time in his life? Well, he's a literal murderer, so he should at least serve some jail time. Shut up, Haruhi. You're missing the point. And, uh, there are some good cops out there, you know. Not all cops can be... <laughs> <laughs> and remember folks, that's life. Alright, well that's the second video essay done. It really shouldn't take any over me over a month to do it, but I'm just locking off at the beginning, yeah. I, I really think that Joker is one of the best movies ever made, like, better than Tax Driver, which it gets compared to constantly. And I made this video essay because of the reason that I think Joker is so brilliant does not seem to be one that many people really share. So I thought that even though there were so many of them on YouTube already, that it was still worth it for me to make another one. So. Yeah, like, I don't even think that this, by my opinion, is shared by Todd Phillips, because in the interviews that I've watched where he's talking about the movie, he doesn't really discuss the sort of grand vision that I outlined at all, and instead he just talks about how he wants this movie to be, you know, like a character study and things like that. And um, I definitely don't think that, that he was thinking about Black Lives Matter either. Um, because that, just in my opinion, he, he kind of comes off as sort of like a, a bro who just, you know, doesn't really get it. Because uh, he has said on record that he stopped making comedy movies because he thought society was too woke for them now. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, not really, like, a, a great opinion to have these days. Uh, but that's, but, like, you do you, and you keep making movies that we can interpret any way we want, thanks to uh, Death the Author. Yeah, uh, that's a good thing, and uh, glad that that exists still. Now, I should make clear that obviously I am not black, and Arthur is also obviously not black, and I don't, and I'm not trying to say, but I think that Arthur's story captures all the complexities of the black experience, and I don't think that I fully grasp that either, but I do think that what Joker is saying lines up a lot more than what I've learned about the Black Lives Matter movement than any sort of incel uprising that the media feared when Joker was first released. Joker wants to fight to destroy the oppressive systems of the world, while incels would rather see them reinstated so that men can be revered again or whatever they want. And I think that the goals of Black Lives Matter can succeed. I think that now that defund the police has become the default rallying cry, there is something that lawmakers can promote without seeming like they're disrupting the normal workings of government. Here in Toronto, City Councilor Josh Matlow has introduced a motion that is a good first step for creating a fairer tomorrow for all citizens. The motion proposes immediately banning the use of deadly force among Toronto police and, defending and defunding their budget by a minimum of 10%. It will also give the Toronto City Council final oversight on where the police invest that budget. Because as of right now, the Toronto police can basically do, do anything they want with the money that they get, which is, um, that's kind of problematic. And uh, yeah, the motion is being voted on by city councillors on Monday, June 29th. And if you're a resident of Toronto, I urge you to check if your councillor is currently in support of the motion. And if they are not, to contact them and tell you where you stand. And I'll have links down in the description for where, for Josh Mantle's proposal itself, what he outlines in it, and, uh, and a, a, as well as like a, a random article that outlines as of right now, which councillors stand for the motion, which councillors stand against it, and which are kind of like on the fence. I urge you to, if your councillor is somebody who you think might be convinced um, to, to join the movement to defund the police, then you should, then as I said, you should call them, uh, email them, contact them in any way that you can. And if, and also that you should contact Mayor John Tory himself because he is, he is planning to vote against the motion in favor of just 
more body cams on police, which it'd be good. I'm not saying it would be bad, but it just would be not entirely what what people want. And so, yeah, to contact him, hopefully he can. Hopefully he'll change his mind. Hopefully he'll see why people are fighting for these things. And if if not, if the motion is defeated and empty words would see councillors choose instead, then the next municipal election is in 2022. And I sincerely hope that Black Lives Matter is not forgotten by then. And if and if we can, then we can put new people in it in place that will make it so that we can make a fairer tomorrow. And uh, yeah, if I didn't make it clear enough in a video, don't don't go around killing people. That's that's not really what I wanted to mean with this video. If that's what you thought I meant by this video, I just more meant. But that's something that heroes should be able to do in in media because uh, stories are not like the real world. And uh, don't go around killing people. It doesn't really accomplish anything now in the real world. It just it's, it's not a good idea. Don't don't do that. So, anyways. Um, I hope that a new video essay will come out sooner than a month from, from now, because uh, that's not a great release schedule, and I hope that one comes out sooner. So until then, uh, bye everybody!